Hello everyone. The Center for Arts and Humanities at AB has the pleasure to be hosting a lecture by Zain Al Khalil entitled Can Art Change the World? Zain Al Khalil believes in the positive impact that art can have on the world. Zaina is an artist, author, cultural activist, and yoga instructor based in Beirut, Lebanon. She holds a Master's of Fine Arts from the School of Visual Arts in NYC, a Bachelor of Graphic Design from the American University of Beirut, and teaching certificates from the Yoga Alliance. El Khalil exhibits internationally, including New York, San Francisco, Miami, London, Paris, Tokyo, and Dubai. She has also held solo exhibitions in Lagos, London, Munich, Turin, and Beirut, and regularly practices in international art fairs. Zena uses visual art, site specific installation, performance, and ritual to explore and heal the war torn history of Lebanon and other global sites of trauma. Believing in the importance of, co of community engagement with contemporary art, she also curates cultural events that create platforms for dialogue and exchange. In 2008, she was invited to speak at the Nobel Peace Center in Oslo, and soon after completed her memoir, Beirut, I Love You, now translated in several languages. Her, writing have also been uh, her writings have also been included in the anthologies Lebanon, Lebanon, Beirut Noir, and Arab Woman Voice, New Realities. While working on adapting her novel into a feature film, she won production awards from the Italian Ministry of Culture, European Media Fund, and the Torino Film Lab. In 2012, Zena was invited to join the TED Fellowship Program, and in 2018, she was awarded a TED Senior Fellowship. In 2018, she was invited to serve as artist in residence at the American University of Beirut. Please join me in welcoming Zena Al Khalil today. Thank you very much for coming out today. Um, like I was saying earlier, I've kind of thrown together a little mix um, of uh, things here and there. And uh, we're going to go for a very casual, unstructured uh, talk today. So more of like a living room conversation, if that's OK with anyone, everyone. If at any point you need to interrupt, Go ahead and do so. Um, I'd rather this is more uh, casual uh, than formal. Is that okay with, yeah? All right, <laughs> great. So um, can art change the world? <sighs> Let's see. <laughs> Maybe how many of you, before we start, think that it can? Okay, how many think it can't? <laughs> so we're all in the spirit of believing that it can and I, I do think that it can and many people do um, and many people have changed the world through simple acts um, through painting, sculptures, performance you know I'm sure I don't need to get into uh, details I'm just going to cover a few uh, pieces that um, uh, inspired me growing up um, to really put the connection between art and activism um, you all remember this piece uh, by John Lennon, Yoko Ono, Bed Peace, where they, they stayed in bed um, to make peace. It was a protest against the Vietnam War at the time. Uh, There's another piece that they did in Times Square. Um, War is over if you want it. Um, so th that was some of the early influences. Um, then moving on, uh, there were the women that influenced me too. The guerrilla girls played a very big part in my education as an artist, as a woman. Um, and it also uh, led me to see the world in, um, in a very specific way. I became critical. Um, I developed skills where I would question things like, why aren't there more women in the museums? And why aren't more women in uh, exhibitions and collections? Um, so that kind of started the, the, the questioning bug. Um, then, of course, there was street art. I mean, this is Banksy, who we all know today. But there was all the stuff that I saw on the walls growing up. Um, a very big impact was um, uh, the work of Marina Abramovic. Um, 
this is the piece that she made as a reaction to um, you know, the part of the world that she comes from and the massacres and the genocide. And I'm going through all of this very quickly because I'm sure a lot of you are uh, um, informed about these works. Um, we, so does everyone know this piece? So this was a piece she did for the Venice Biennale in 97. And uh, she basically scrubbed bones for, I think it was a month or something, in uh, the basement of uh, one of the buildings. And it was a commentary on genocide and mass murder. Um, and she basically sat there rubbing the blood off uh, animal bones um, day and night. So at this point now, I'm starting to connect to the idea of body and using the body to create work and putting the body through uh, difficult um, uh, circumstances in order to make a statement through art. Uh, this is Te Ching She. Um, this is from his series called um, One Year Performances. So he'd do something for one year that usually um, pushed the individual, pushed his body to um, uh, extremes in order to make a statement and this was his first piece in which he stayed in a, a cage for a year. He didn't leave um, for a whole year. He had all his meals. He didn't talk. Um, then, then we wonder about, you know, is this art that's happening within the realm of the art world? Does it extend and influence people outside? Can art change the world? I'm sorry, this is a little bit graphic. We'll get lighter in a second. Um, but this is Abbas uh, Amin in 2003, and he was a refugee who escaped. Uh, he's a Kurdish Iranian who escaped, landed in London. The British were trying to exit him, and he sealed up uh, his eyes and mouth as a form of protest. So, so I question sometimes. I, I don't question, but I try to make connections between, you know, does it start in the art world and somehow trickle? into the, the rest of the world, or is it something that happens within the real and then comes back to influence artists? Um, there's also the work of Anna Mendita, um, who used her body uh, as, um, she was a Cuban in exile in the States, and uh, she created these earthworks with her body, contouring her body with earth, rocks, even blood. And this was a way to somehow uh, demolish boundaries and kind of reunite with her homeland. Um, so this, her works dealt a lot with displacement and questioned nationalism and gender identity. And these were things that I started picking up on um, when I was younger. Now, this is all kind of stuff that uh, we see being created in the West. What about here? What about the stuff that's homegrown? I'm going to jump straight into uh, 2011, hello, um, with the Arab Spring. And I'm sure you guys all remember this photo from the internet. Have, have we all seen it? Yeah? So this, was a, this is in Cairo, and this is a lady who was uh, peacefully demonstrating, and uh, uh, she was attacked by the police. And this made headlines around the world because she was actually um, in a hijab. So it uh, raised the alarm bells that you know not only was a woman being attacked, but this is also um, a woman in a in a hijab. And so, so we started reacting, right? As artists, as um, what did we start doing? This is the work of Bahia Shab. Uh, Bahia was also a student uh, here at AUB 20 years ago, and um, and to kind of bring to light. Um, the atrocities that was happening, she started spray painting. Um, her famous piece is called A Thousand Times No. If you haven't seen her TED talk yet, it's incredible. It's about this work. And then she started uh, stenciling the blue bra piece also. Um, and then it suddenly became this kind of like superhero. You know, this blue bra lady could <laughs> come back and, and hit back at any time. And so again, here we're seeing this crossover between what's happening in, in let's call it the quote-unquote real world and then the art world and the crossing over that happens. And it was, I mean, 2011 was such a profound year that, um, you know, Time magazine called us, the protesters, uh, person of the year, everyone who took down to the streets. Um, so this was a time that really... Um, 
it was very inspiring for me as an artist because all my life I had been learning and reading about all these works that were made by um, people in the West and then now here we were trying to develop our own language. But what is this language that we're building? You know, we, we don't have a long history of contemporary art that's all relatively new. And so I was really um, taken by the spirit of, uh, you know, spontaneous creativity and, you know, this is, um, I have a whole series of these images that I was collecting of headgear that people were creating on the spot to protect themselves from uh, rubber bullets during the protests. And it's just so fascinating to see, I mean, you know, looking at this, this is beautiful sculptural work, the guy in the back with the pot on his head. Um, right now, it's so funny, on my Instagram feed this morning uh, came up this... Um, there's a Saudi woman artist, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, but she creates these sculptural pieces out of old pots and pans. And it's like, it's the big thing right now in Saudi. Everyone's looking at pots and pans, but they're hanging on a wall. Um, you know, then there's a lot of uh, beautiful graffiti coming up on our walls. And then simultaneously, uh, there was this kind of looking back at the body and the woman's body coming back in now as a tool for protest. And so this is Femin and all the work that they were doing, you know, starting like uh, in around the same time uh, that our protests were happening here. Femin was on the rise in, in the West and also coming back to influence us here. There was Amina in uh, Morocco and in um, uh, Greece there was, um, oh, help me, I forgot her name, the girl with the red shoes. She posted a picture of herself completely in the nude, but with red shoes on, and she'd written on her body, you know, my body is, is mine, it's my revolution. My and, Cairo. huh? In Cairo. In Cairo, yeah. Uh, Alia. Alia, Alia, yeah, 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 yeah. So, and she I eventually had to leave, but she started this whole kind of um, a string of movements of, of women using their bodies to protest, including Amina in, in Morocco. And then there's all the stereotypes that we were starting to address. Um, this is a work by Sharif Wakid in which, you know, he has that typical, um, you know, martyr video, uh, except here it's the handsome Saleh Bakri, and instead of reading, uh, you know, from the Quran, he's actually reading things, I believe it's from Thousand and One Nights, um, and, but still in the same serious tone, and it was really a kind of play on people in the West and how they view us uh, and how they view Arab men and the stereotypes. So it's really a, a very exciting time to be an artist in this part of the world because there's just so much going on and there's so much that we can do um, uh, as artists to, um, to make statements, to make changes. Um, now we're going to take a little break from art hist contemporary art uh, um, uh, happenings and uh, move on a little bit to um, uh, to my life. Um, when I saw this, so this is also a can art change the world piece because I saw this when I was eight years old and um, I'd been I grew up in Africa in Nigeria and um, uh, I had no exposure to let's say more um, refined con uh, art. Um, I was very much connected to the earth and shamanic practices, but I had not really had exposure to works by um, European artists. And then I saw this painting and uh, at the sculpture, sorry, and at that moment I knew in all my being that I wanted to become an artist. I was very young, um, around eight years old, and I had no idea what it was. I had no idea who Michelangelo was, but there was something about the power of the piece, just, just, that, just the piece without even really knowing what the message was behind it, if there even was a message. Um, it didn't matter. There was something that radiated magically from this work, and it just took my breath away. And at that moment, I decided, whatever it takes, um, I'm going to be an artist. 
So fast forward um, to 1994, I moved to Beirut. Um, at the time, um, my family wasn't living here, so it was a conscious choice I made uh, to come and be part of the rebuilding of the country. I'm not a nationalist, but it was a kind of pull, um, perhaps a divine fate, destiny, Again, a little bit of that magic that I feel very connected to. Um, and I studied graphic design at the time the fine arts department uh, hadn't, um, uh, there were no fine arts, uh, there was no fine arts department. So um, I found myself having a hard time with <coughs> design because there was this, um, um, I felt that there was a, a bit of a limitation in terms of how I wanted to um, place myself in the world and I realized that growing up in Africa really gave me special insight onto the realities of the world and um, and I want I was very much affected by the atrocities that I had experienced both in Africa and here um, at such a young age I received daily exposure to violence and poverty and um, you know, everything from having a gun held to my head to being called pussy on Bliss Street when I was 18 years old. And I had no idea what to do with that. Um, it was quite strange. There's something about the 90s, right, after the Civil War ended. Um, there was a kind of craziness that pervaded the streets of Beirut. Uh, but I was open to it. I was 18 and I was um, hungry for uh, for this type of rebirth, this rebirth energy that, that Beirut was going through. So th this, I would say, is my first um, official work of art, where I tried to incorporate some graphic design skills, but it was mostly the influence of the Fluxus movement that was really is, is what um, put this piece together. And um, it was a play on, on um, let's say, early kind of um, feminist work meets humor. Um, something that was very important to me was that you know, um, humor could go a very long way in getting uh, your point across. So this was my AUB ID and I stuck these all around campus and the idea was to see what people would circle and then I'd collect them and I'd know if I was a pussy or a woman. Um, Unfortunately, they didn't last very long because some people thought someone was doing this um, uh, as a trick or in, to spite me or something. Um, so for my own protection, uh, some friends <laughs> removed them. And so I never got my answer. Until to this day, I don't really know um, what I am. <laughs> and um, yeah, so then I started another series uh, where... I made these cards uh, and I was collecting words that people would say to me on the street. I don't know what it was about the 90s. It's like men just had to, um, you know, make these sexual comments and innuendos all the time. It's gotten much better. I, I don't hear it anymore. But it's probably because I've now put on at least 10 kilos and have white hair. So maybe that's why they've left me alone. Um, no, but the city has changed. It, it's definitely calmed down a lot. So I made these little postcards. Um, I'm not pussy. I'm not I'm not whipped cream, uh, sweet cream. And I leave them in taxis, in services, because that's where I got most of the, the comments uh, back then. Uh, when I think about it, I don't know, perhaps it was, maybe I was so curious um, and hungry and ready to be an artist that I perhaps purposefully put myself in situations where things would come up so that I could kind of um, have some kind of visual reaction. And of course here, there's still, I'm trying to be a graphic designer um, cards. <laughs> um, so I'm done with AUB now and uh, I decide to become a full-time artist and let go of um, of the design world, but you can still see some of it in compositions. And in this, in these series of work, they're uh, early um, 
again, it's this, you know, it's this daily interaction with Beirut and my place as a woman and um, topics of the body. And so I made a series of works where, in a way, I um, took the figure of the macho, macho man and really tried to um, subdue him. Um, and again, this was a humorous way to just, you know, to poke on topics of violence and aggression and war. Um, I used a lot of plastic at the time because in my eyes, plastic is made from oil and oil is what mankind is at war for. And so the materials had to reflect uh, the topic. Um, and the works at this point were often categorized as kitsch, but I, th I don't think of them that way because there's a very strong um, feminist message behind them. I just didn't really fit into um, a category. And so uh, showing these works in the West, oftentimes um, the works would be um, simply categorized as kitsch, but there was a lot of uh, personal anger and stress uh, that informed these works. A lot of the materials I picked were from daily life around me. So this is what was available in Beirut in the early 2000s. Um, then I started getting into performative work. And uh, this, is, this piece um, first started off, um, it was called Wahed Aris, please. And it was a time in my life where, uh, so that means a husband, please. It was a time in my life where, um, you know, as women in this country, you're expected to get married at a certain age. And um, I didn't want to have any of that. Uh, it, you know, the tradition is that mothers come and check you out. So instead, I put on a dress and went out in search of a man who would have me. And, um, <laughs> um, after 2006 war, I changed the dress slightly and I changed the mission of this um, performance and I now called her the Pink Bride of Peace. This was after the, the war, the July war. Um, at that point, my whole life changed. So all this work I had been doing, um, you know, in the beginning, um, forget it. It just, nothing, I just felt like there was no point in pointing fingers anymore. And I wanted to um, develop the work to become a platform for healing. But at the time, I didn't know, um, I didn't know uh, how it would manifest. So here, she's the pink bride of peace. Um, I don't do the performance anymore. Um, this performance went on for 15 years and then, no, because I missed the year. I would say, let's say 13 years. Um, and she has now retired. She's doing other things. So in 2006, um, there are three events that marked my life. And uh, as an artist, changed the way I view the world and the way I make my work. Um, this is my best friend, Maya, my soulmate. This is a picture taken in 1995, I believe, 1994, and we're on my rooftop uh, here in Ain Mraisi. And, you know, we, we grew up, I met her here at AUB, and it was instant friendship. Um, it was souls that recognized each other. And we were so adamant on becoming artists and writers, and we were going to move to New York City and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Um, life happened, things happened, and um, 2006 happened. So 2006, the bombs start falling, and um, I took to writing a blog. And uh, I was writing about daily life under the bombs. And the blog was very well received by international audience. The media was very slow to respond to what was happening. And so I wrote uh, an email the, the night the bomb started falling, and I sent it out to my entire mailing list in the morning. I basically wrote all night, and the idea was that through writing, I, I would uh, live to see another day, like Shahrazad, if people could hear my story, that perhaps I would have a chance to live. And um, come morning, uh, the sun came up, 
and um, I was still alive so I sent the email out to everyone on my mailing list and then immediately I slept for about three hours and when I woke up my inbox was flooded um, and so I continued to write BBC, The Guardian, CNN, everyone started writing to me and I couldn't keep up with the responses so um, a friend of mine told me about something called a blog and so we set this up and I started blogging and um, I was blogging about daily life under the bombs, I was blogging about Maya because now Maya had been diagnosed with cancer. It had been a few months that she'd been receiving um, chemotherapy and I was writing just about what it was like to be a normal woman, best friend is sick, possibly dying, um, artist, dreams have been crushed, uh, wife at the time, um, you know, worried that I may never live to have children, um, all that stuff. And I, I, you know, I, I have to say it was the first time um, the world was receiving live transmission that was not politically motivated during a war from a, a citizen-based journalism, if you want to call it. And there was the war happening on ground, and then there was the war happening in cyberspace. And soon, so many um, people started blogging too. Uh, I'm sure you guys remember uh, Mazen Kirbej's blog, and these are some of my favorite pieces. Uh, of course, there's uh, the Paeta, and then him threatening that, you know, I will kill you with my pen. <laughs> Um, so the world was able to um, connect to us as humans through the work we were doing in cyberspace um, with our art and our writing and our music. Um, at the time, Mazen and I think Sharif also uh, recorded the sounds of bombs and they were playing, Mazen was playing his trumpet to, to the bombs in real time as they were falling. And so we were really able to, I believe, that the war ended so quickly because we were able to raise so much awareness in such a short period of time. Um, again, this is the world before Facebook, before Twitter even. Um, so things were very different back then. Um, because of the, um, the, the coverage of the blog and the connections that it made with so many people, um, I always feel a bit embarrassed saying this, but the blog may have been the first widely followed Middle Eastern blog um, because it just never existed before. And so the Nobel Peace Center invited me to come and give a talk about freedom of expression on the internet. And really I used it as an opportunity to share um, all the blogs that other artists, musicians and writers um, were keeping uh, during the war. Um, that's Jimmy Wales in the middle, the founder of Wikipedia, and it was um, really interesting to be a, like a, an honor to be able to share that information of the work that we were doing here uh, directly with Wikipedia. Um, after that, um, two wars after uh, two wars, <laughs> two months after the war ended, um, Maya passed away, and. Um, it was a great death in my life, a great loss, and um, I didn't think that I could recover, but uh, I started writing one night because I saw her in a dream, and the dream was so very real um, that I genuinely believe it was a visitation. And, um, and she said, don't worry, I'm okay, I live here now. She showed me this beautiful white world, all the houses were white and there were white picket fences and the streets were white and the trees were white. And I realized that Maya had ended up in white suburbia, <laughs> heaven. <laughs> um, but she was happy and, uh, and so I, I woke up at about four in the morning and part of, in part of that dream, um, before we got to the white space, I was, I kept pulling her out of a grave, uh, of her grave, and then she kept kind of disappearing and going back in, and then I'd pull her out of her grave, and, and it felt so real, and we'd escape, we'd run out of the graveyard, get into the service, and then suddenly she'd disappear again, and that kept happening over and over until we ended up in heaven, 
and now I sound like a crazy woman, but then I woke up at four in the morning and I started writing that dream. And I wrote and I wrote and I wrote, and then two years later, Beirut, I Love You came out. Um, the book was a healing process and uh, it helped me come to terms with uh, the loss of Maya, but it also helped me uh, capture uh, our friendship which happened to be set in post-war Beirut of the 90s, which was such a very special time in our history. Um, a lot of the work we do as artists in Lebanon, um, a lot of us deal with this idea of memory and collective amnesia. And so it was very important for me to, um, to write about the 90s in the way that I had lived and experienced it. Um, so at this time now, I'm starting to feel a little better, and <laughs> oh, I also divorced, and um, so there was the war, there was destruction, death, and divorce. Those were the three, um, the three Ds of 2006, but that completely catapulted my work in a new direction. So this is the kind of in-between phase, and um, again, going back to the idea of body and body and space, um, I now uh, was thinking about how, you know, most of our wars have been caused by this word God, <laughs> you know, my God is correct, your God sucks, and the God that I had met, the force of life that somehow gave me a second chance to come back, um, after the years of darkness post Maya. I mean, writing Beirut, I Love You was a healing process, but those years were, were very dark and painful, and there were days where I just couldn't get out of bed, and I'm sure we've all, we, we all know what that feels like. Um, you know, living here in this part of the world, we're, we're blessed to have such a spectrum of experiences from the very beautiful to the very ugly but it just makes us the fabulous people that we are. So I started, you know, kind of questioning, like, not questioning, but asking, you know, who, what, what is this God? And, you know, I, I view God as, or a source, as something that brings us together. And this is a work that reflects on um, the 90s, you know, we, I believe that we, um, so this is a four by four meter Allah disco ball. And um, people are invited here to dance rather than fight under the light of God. And this was really a reflection of um, what it felt like to live the 90s. You know, after the war ended, everyone was just partying. And then suddenly, it didn't matter what religion you were. It didn't matter what part of Lebanon you came from. You know, in, in the nightclubs, everyone was equal. And, you know, what set you apart was your dance moves and how much vodka you could drink. Um, and so this work, this was like the beginning of, let's say, my um, uh, adventures into spirituality. And um, it was the bridge between the older work and where I place myself today. So, today. <laughs> um, Space without the dark could not hold the stars. Carving this piece onto slate, I came to understand the value of pain, the opportunity that, um, that we have to learn from pain. And reflecting over um, you know, the 10, 15 years in Beirut and all the traumas that came with it, um, I started trying to process all of that and create work that no longer uh, poked fun, that no longer pointed fingers, but rather inspired um, a kind of um, waking of uh, human consciousness. Now, you thought I was done with my traumas, but there's still one really big one. Um, and this was really the transitional moment. Um, so our house, I'm from the south of Lebanon, from Hasbaya, and our home was taken during the uh, Israeli occupation and turned into a military detention center. Within our house, um, people were uh, interrogated and even tortured. Um, they took our home because it was on a hill, 
So it was militarily very strategic. So it wasn't a personal hit, it was pure military strategy. And, um, and for over 22 years, they used our house um, as a prison center. Um, the day after uh, the liberation of the South, we went down and um, this is how we found our home. Uh, graffiti everywhere, tea walls, and of course there were visible signs of uh, torturing of human beings. I'm not going to get into details, but there were, um, there were cells, um, there was... Um, Okay, I will get into details. <laughs> there was human excrement and blood stains on the floor, so you know that people were being held there for a long time. So at the time I took these photos, not really knowing what to do with it all. But as an artist, I knew that it was important to witness. And um, I'm going to go back to this thing of witnessing in a second. So I took these photos, but it took me 15 years to process what happened and to understand what it is that I could do as an artist. I needed, to, I needed time. I needed time to mature as a woman, as a human. Um, this, this, the work that would come from this um, required an entirely different education, not one that I received from Beirut, or from universities, but rather the, the University of Life. And um, I started traveling around the world to develop a spiritual education because that was what I felt what was really lacking in my life. And there was this calling towards healing my personal, um, my personal pain. So at this point, I started, this question started arising, you know, is it possible to create a work that if you placed it anywhere in the world could bring healing energy, could change the world, could put an end to violence. As an artist, could I create this object? And so that was always kind of at the background um, as I began traveling uh, for, my, for my spiritual education. So I've been going to India a lot um, and uh, in those travels, I've been focusing on the power of sacred sound and subtle vibration. Um, the further I got into spiritual, uh, sci uh, spiritual studies, I found that there is a spiritual science involved too, and studying quantum physics, um, on a very superficial level. I'm not take, you know, I'm not claiming anything, but we've come to understand that the entire world is made of uh, vibration. And, um, and so through the power of sound, through vibration, perhaps we could change the world around us. Um, so that's what I've been studying there. I've also um, studied with shamanic practitioners um, from uh, the UK, from indigenous people of North America, American Indians, and really going back to ancient arts and sciences that once informed us and could he and, and healed us um, uh, as a species. Now I'm going to pause for a second and go back to this thing about witnessing. Um, I was in front of the Twin Towers when they fell in 2001 and uh, at the time I was studying for my uh, Masters of Fine Arts and watching the first building fall, it's funny because everyone was running away, um, but I was there with uh, two friends, uh, some of you may know Lena Mirhej, the one of the founders of Samandal comics, we were studying there together, and <laughs> Lena and I were running towards the building because, you know, as, as this, this thing, this natural tendency within us, I don't know, is it, is it that we're Lebanese? Is it that we lived here and we've developed a kind of curiosity or a thick skin or a blind faith or something um, towards violence, but we both understood very deeply that we needed to witness this because as artists, we were going to make work out of this. 
Um, and so we were running towards and everyone was running the other way. And then there was a part where we could no longer cross. It was around 16th Street, 17th Street, but we were on 6th Avenue, so there are no buildings in the way, and we had a clear view. And as the first building came down and the big cloud of smoke welled up, I understood then that violence has become universal. It's not just here in this part of the world, but it's been exported, it's been morphed, it's internal, it's who knows. But the important thing is that we had to witness that, knowing that as artists we were going to make work from it. Fast forward now back to, this is around 2013. At this point, I've now developed uh, ceremonies um, to um, create works that would heal uh, spaces and places that endured violence and trauma in Lebanon. So in the early works, I started by burning veils, um, veils that were worn of, um, by women of my uh, religious background, which are the Druze. And in a way, it was uh, you know, this um, need as a woman to liberate myself from that, uh, from this idea that I needed a veil to be able to connect to God. Um, there is, and I'm, I always say this, it's with all the love in my heart that I share this because we're all here on our individual journeys and I make no assumptions about veils or people who wear veils. Uh, I'm just focused on my own specific journey as an artist and traveling now to the East to receive my spiritual education because as a Druze, I did not have access to it here. You have to be a, a lay person like myself, does not have access to the real teachings. You have to convert to become like a monk, you know, or a sheikha to receive that knowledge. And so I had to go abroad to receive that. And in the East, I was taught that, you know, in order to reach source um, or the creator or God or whatever you want to call it, um, we must let go of the material world because the truth is within. And we all have the power to connect to source in our own, through our own way. And so that meant shedding. So I had to start cutting identity. I had to start cutting the identity of, of being a woman even. I had to cut ties with my religious background. I had to erase myself in order to rebuild myself. So I took the veils and I burnt them, and using the ashes, I created a special ink on site. And I began first by using my body to paint. So I would take the remains of the ashes, pour them on my heart, and then start using my body to paint with. So every dot you see there is the point where my heart touched the canvas. And so there was a kind of rebirth that was happening with this. Like sometimes you just need to hit ground zero in order to start rebuilding. And so this work of reconnecting or um, to source in my own way of using my body in a way that was unexpected, uh, of uh, working directly in nature, in places that had endured violence. Uh, I began meditating, I began incorporating poetry into the works. So these pieces are quite large. Um, and because I was using my entire body to paint with. Um, and this was all done through using the veil. Um, here in this piece, for example, you can actually see parts of the remnants of the veil that was stuck on. So all this work came together for an exhibition called From Mirfak to Vega, which are two stars that I, would, I was painting under every night while I made these works. And, um, and this, uh, this exhibition took place in Italy. I shipped over my paintings and two blast walls that were um, left over in our house by the Israeli army. So here we're working with objects as witnesses. And each wall is uh, basically a ton and a half. So I shipped three tons of Israeli concrete <laughs> to Italy. Um, and, you know, it's this whole thing like, 
how do you how do you um, how do you talk about contemporary violence? How do you um, you know objects? Objects can be a form of witnessing. Objects have stories to tell, um, and so it was very important to put these pieces in to because they they say everything. Um, I'm just gonna skip a little bit because we're. All right, so let's forward now back to, so after I did this work in Italy, um, I felt that I had somehow healed, that was the work I had done with, with healing my, my home. So um, I'm going to go into more detail now about the actual healing ceremonies, because this is, this is where we find ourselves, this is where I'm, I find myself with my work today. So as as I was saying, um, I've been conducting these healing ceremonies in places that endured violence and trauma. Um, and some of these places include abandoned houses in Su al Gharib. Um, this is Khiam Prison, uh, you know, the notorious concentration camp that was built uh, during the Israeli occupation of the South. Um, um, I also, so both my parents' houses were destroyed um, during the war. So my dad's was taken by the Israeli army. My mom's was blown up by the USS New Jersey, the American battleship that was parked off the waters for a while and shooting aimlessly into the, um, the mountains. So this is, this is not my mother's house because it was rebuilt right away uh, in the 80s, but this is a house uh, very close to it that was shelled during the same uh, bombing. This is in Ras al-Jabal um, So working in these spaces, um, yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Let me go into details of what the actual ritual and ceremonies are because it's through these rituals and ceremonies that I actually create my work. So what I do is I go to these places, I spend time uh, in meditation trying to connect to the energy of the space. The walls can tell us so much about, um, about um, the events that happened in a, in a space. Um, and, I, and I work in these spaces also because the history that we've inherited as a nation uh, is incoherent. As you know, um, history post-1975 is not taught in our public schools. And so this, these works also as an opportunity to, um, to document uh, atrocities that happened um, uh, during, uh, in, in Lebanon. So I spend time connecting to the energy of the space and I really work on emptying myself to become a sort of hollow reed or hollow bone where I can just work on transmitting the story of the space. It's not about me anymore. I've dealt with my trauma, alhamdulillah. <laughs> but now I'm working with um, the stories that the spaces have to tell. Um, and uh, I do the fire ceremony, and now I'm, I'm not burning veils anymore. Instead, I take objects uh, from the space, uh, and I burn them, and through that, kind of um, that fire is symbolic of uh, transformation or transmutation of energy. It's a way of clearing energy in a space and it's also um, a, a symbolic uh, of transforming whatever residual negative energy might still be there into love, light and peace. I collect the ashes, I make the special ink again, I lay out my canvases on the floor and then I start painting. Um, now I've been using the kafiyah to paint with, so I dip the kafiyah in the ink and then I start um, hitting the canvases with the kafiyah. Um, I also, while I, I do this, I chant um, words or mantras, if you want to call them, or prayers. And so here, um, before I start painting, I'm writing the word rahma. I might write it a hundred times, I might write it a thousand times, whatever it takes to, um, to clear the energy um, within me so that I can really be a translator for the space. Um, this is an example of, uh, this is also Rahma, I can't see, yeah. Uh, so these are also some works that I do, um, where I, it's a basically, it's, it's a meditation exercise to empty myself. Um, and the words that I chant on site are Rahma, Ghafran, Mawadda, Salam, 
compassion, forgiveness, love, peace. And when I'm done with the ceremonies and the paintings, I leave the words, I paint them on little canvas and I leave them stuck uh, on the place so that even after I leave these spaces during my daily meditation where I repeat these words, either uh, through chanting or by the little mantra circles that I make, I'm still connecting to that space and I'm still able to send healing energy to that space simply through the power of the word. And again, the word, the basis of the word being vibration. We'll get more into the science of that in a second. Um, in the end, I do a whirling ceremony, um, and it's an offering that I make to the space to directly connect that place of pain uh, to the higher powers that be, whatever you want to call um, it, <laughs> her. Um, this is an example of one of the pieces uh, I made with the kafiyeh. This was made at the Grand Hotel Saufar. Um, this was in 2013 or 2014. Um, so you can see traces of the kafiyeh. This is a piece I made on Ramlet al-Bayda. Uh, Ramlet al-Bayda Beach was um, in 2006. If you remember, our fuel reserves were hit by the Israeli army and 15,000 tons of fuel uh, fell into our uh, Mediterranean. It's the largest environmental disaster of the Mediterranean, which very few people um, speak about. But um, so this work also aims to uh, to document um, uh, you know that event and keep it in our recent history. Um, so th that whole body of work uh, took about five years to make, and uh, last year. I held a, an exhibition at uh, Beit Beirut, which is this building over here in Sodiko Square. And, um, and uh, I showed the works that were produced. I'm going to show connected to you. Sorry. Al Kala 2014 and Al Kala's iPhone. Thank you. OK. I'm going to show a little video of um, one of the video, so the exhibition, I showed paintings, sculptures, video, sound art pieces. The sound pieces were made th uh, through recordings of the chantings that I did on site that I later turned into soundscapes. Um, this is a very short uh, video. So we started a little bit late. Um, if anyone needs to leave at three, please go ahead. I think I need another a good 10 minutes to finish the talk. But if any of you need to leave at any time, please go ahead. So let's watch this. Hope it works. Yeah. <laughs>
And I bring this up not out of spite or anger, but just, you know, we, it's a moment to reflect on what we have going up against us as artists in Lebanon and in the Middle East. It's not easy. So anyone who um, is working in this field, like really, bravo, because there's, uh, it's already hard enough to do the work and then to preserve it and uh, categorize, uh, not categorize, what's the word? Um, Archive. Archive, thank you. Uh, it's quite a challenge. And usually these are things that artists, perhaps in other countries, um, don't worry so much about, but as artists in the Middle East, it's really important that um, that we take, I believe it's important that we take all these things into consideration so that we can build a history um, that uh, future generations can have access to. I know how hard it was for me to get access to the artists, you know, the older generation that came before me. Um, and so per perhaps that kind of Artivist or you know art activist spirit in me also has that need to to archive um, for reasons like that. Anyway, uh, let's move quickly. So this is Big Beirut, and uh, in the exhibition I had paintings and sculptures, and um, and the exhibition went on for forty days. It was a multidisciplinary project, um, and I and really. You know, and this desire to, to heal, um, I went back to this idea of, you know, can we create an object that if you put it anywhere, could transform a nation, could put an end to violence. Um, and so I, I felt that it wasn't enough to simply show the works that I had been uh, creating in this time. For example, this is a series of uh, tiles that reads the word in front. I'm just gonna read something. Uh, to you about why I work with um, with words. So the word is the audible manifestation of breath, and all the while, from silence to breath to sound, there is vibration or spanda in Sanskrit, the subtle creative pulse of the universe as it manifests into living form. And it is these words that have powerful healing vibrations that I choose to work with. If the entire cosmos and all that exists, from the smallest quark to the largest quasar, consists of sound vibrations, nada, then we could use sound energy, even our very thoughts, or spandan, thought vibration, as building blocks, building blocks to create a global matrix of peace and reconciliation. So, inspired by nada yoga, which is union through sound, and dikit, which is repetition of devotional phrases um, in Sufi Islam. I use words in a creative play of consciousness in the form and form awakening to consciousness. My sculptural mantras become perfect units in a complex arabesque, multiplying and expanding through anahata, unstruck sound, and pranava, audible sound, creating a bridge between universal consciousness and the physical world in an interrelationship between vibration and form within the matrix of space-time being. Okay, that's, that's the thing with, with words, that perhaps it is through that simple word, perhaps the word could be um, the, the tool that puts an end to violence. But um, as I continued with the work um, and put this show together, um, I realized it would be really um, what was missing and what I had been learning in my travels was the potential of the human. And perhaps it wasn't an object, uh, but perhaps the human was the object. And as I worked on developing my um, education, I learned more about the potential I had as a human to create this change. And so the focus now became to, um, to work on creating space for humans to come in and do that kind of evolutionary work. Um, for example, uh, this is um, an installation uh, I created called 17,000 Times uh, Forgiveness, Forgiveness 17,000 Times, and it was a reference to the, uh, the Green Line, uh, which is where Beit Beirut was uh, located on, um, the Green Line that split uh, the city of Beirut in half during the Civil War. Um, 
um, and it was called the Green Line because it was so dangerous that humans stopped uh, walking through and where humans stopped, nature prevailed and perhaps that was the beginning of the healing. Perhaps it was nature that started doing the healing <coughs> already. And so uh, I made 17,000 green lines, one for each person still declared missing from the Civil War. And here I invited families of the disappeared to come together and actually uh, put the, 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 produce the work to put the, the sticks in. Um, and so I thought it was going to be a symbolic thing where everyone would just put one stick in for their loved one. But the act of working and repetition and taking part in something was a healing process. And so uh, they ended up putting together a large part of the installation, which I'm very grateful for. And I think that um, you know, that was almost like a taste of the potential of what we have as human beings when, when we work together, um, helping each other to heal. Along with the um, exhibition, uh, I curated sorry, uh, whoop, um, 40 days of workshops. Uh, so the exhibition was 40 days long. Why 40 days? Because it takes 40 days to make a change in um, your brain, uh, in your habits. So if you're trying to make or break a habit, you do it every day for 40 days. Um, and so the idea was that if we did something positive for Beirut, in 40 days could Beirut evolve into the city of light. So we had, um, and the idea was also to help people develop their own toolbox of uh, healing techniques and modalities. So I invited people to come in and give workshops, whether it was um, uh, introduction to yoga or Reiki. Uh, Muna al was giving um, weekly tours of the buildings, as you may know. Uh, it was Muna who saved the building um, to begin with. Um, and so this went on for 40 days and we had close to 10,000 people come to the exhibition. And again, I feel a little embarrassed to say this, but maybe it was a first. Um, and I think the daily interaction with people, uh, such as this mantra painting table, where people could come and practice color meditation, um, so that's, that's what that is over there. Um, you know, we had, um, I invited schools to come and, uh, you know, there was really daily, daily interaction with people. Um, to sum up, so I, you know, I, the question has always been, you know, is it possible to create this, um, this, uh, this object that could put an end to violence? And after years of work and research and traveling the world and asking, um, scientists and gurus, um, and I always make a joke about this, but really racking up an enormous amount of, um, of uh, airline miles, it's, it just, it's painful because sometimes we have to go out to be able to come back in, but that whole journey all around brought me back and I realized that it is, it is possible you are that object and the journey is really an internal one and um, I would say the highlight of the exhibition was um, a man came up to me and he pointed to this work that says from forgiveness um, and it's 108 tiles uh, laid out on the floor and um, and he said to me, you know, he just came up to me and he said, uh, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. Uh, why? And he pointed at the tiles. And, you know, he said, forgiveness, thank you. And I said, sure, you know, but I didn't really understand at the time. And he was very emotional and I was very emotional. And then I asked him, I said, can you share a little bit more? And he's, he, he shared that he was a child soldier during the war that um, he was fighting in Beit Beirut in 1978. And, uh, and he left Lebanon in 1978, I think he was about 13 years old. Um, and he'd never been back since then. And he worked on years uh, trying to heal himself. Um, he, he walked mountains for three years in Europe. That's how, that's, he told me that's how he healed, it was through nature. And it was this kind of excruciating, you know, putting his body 
um, pushing his body to extremes, and then the, the natural healing effects that came through nature that helped him heal, but he had never been able to come back to Be Beirut. And as soon as he walked in, he was very uncomfortable. He had his daughter with him, and he felt ashamed. Um, but the first piece he saw was this piece on the floor um, that said forgiveness. And so at that moment, I realized really the power, the power of art and human connection and how important it is when trying to heal a nation that we also work with the, the men behind the guns, you know, especially the men behind the guns. And for me, that was really full circle to the works I had been doing um, 15 years ago. Um, I felt that I had finally found my platform and way to communicate with uh, people who had been, who had been um, violent or aggressive with me in the past. And so, and so yes, you are that object. I'm going to read a little something. You are that object. You are the greatest work of art ever created. You can work on a personal level to become that instrument of peace as peace starts within. If we can tune ourselves back to the resonance of universal love, which I have come to learn is our true essence, universal love, then everything else falls into place. We are that object. Art is the tool and love is the way, connecting us all to everything that ever was and ever will be, every atom, every leaf, every whale, every star, every breath come together to create the beautiful fabric that is this here, us now, love, love, love. Thank you. I know we're really over time, but no, again, if anyone needs to leave, please go ahead, but I'm here to answer any questions. Yeah, we'll open the floor to Q and A for those who wish to ask questions.
Because that's where the transformation happened. That's where I developed, you know, this kind of insight that um, uh, of the tools uh, that I need to use and the techniques and um, the need also. So that would be like around uh, 20, 2012, 2013 okay. was when I was spending a lot of time in Haspaya. But I'd already been traveling, I'd already been studying, but it, they, it wasn't integrated. There were two worlds happening, and then they integrated around them. Um, as for, is, are there change, like, did things change? Yeah, I mean, I can say that with um, the Beit Beirut exhibition, yes. Sacred Catastrophe Healing Lebanon, um, from this exhibition, a lot of new things came up. Uh, within one year, we've seen, um, so Nawal Flehan, who gave an introduction to Reiki class, mm -hmm. has gone on to create an NGO called Nafas. Because um, she was so impressed by the uh, um, readiness for people to receive knowledge on Reiki, she now um, she decided that she wants to take Reiki and healing arts throughout Lebanon. And she now goes to a village once a month to give um, healing, yoga, sound meditation, uh, classes to communities that normally would not be able to come to Beirut for like a, a workshop. So she's been to, um, so in the south, Rashaya and Haspaya, Vintage Bay is coming next. She's done some places um, in the mountains, in Shuf. Um, so yeah, like almost every month. So that's an example. And that's something now that's spreading um, like a wildfire. It's just amazing because you see how much need there is for, for eating and that people are ready to come together. And that was another thing we saw at, at Beit Beirut is that we often think that we don't want to talk about our pain and we're not ready as a, communi as a community, but it was quite the opposite there. Um, some people would come several times. Uh, there was a lady who came out of the 40 days. She was probably there for 30 days and she would paint the mantra, you know, every day and just listen in. So there was that. There's now, you know, this year we've seen the use of um, a lot of abandoned spaces being used as uh, cultural. It's not new, but it's suddenly, you know, um, it's all, uh, there's a kind of spirit that's pushing uh, more art to be displayed in, um, in abandoned spaces. So because of the work I was doing at the hotel, uh, the owners may have felt inclined to, I don't know, to maybe they had already decided to kind of um, refer, like uh, open it up to the public. And so there was a great um, exhibition by Tom Young there yeah. a couple months ago. Um, you know, a lot of the people who had come in for yoga classes are still going. Um, a lot of students uh, are practicing meditation. Um, yeah, and there is like this thing now where we can talk about art and healing, I think, in the same sentence. Like it's opened that discussion up. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I haven't been yet, but I heard that the Salon d'Automne at Sirsa this year is very kind of, uh, 
focusing on environment or environmental issues, and that, I mean that, um, you know, that has its roots in healing as well, uh, and it's a, a discourse that is not so common in the past with uh, big art exhibitions. Who knows how these things, uh, yeah. Yeah, but everyone who participated in the exhibition as in terms of giving a workshop or lecture has had a lot of interest in their work continue after the exhibition. So more students and things, yeah. Thank you very much, yes. Yeah. Um, do you think you will continue this path of healing? Do you think this is something that you want to develop further? And do you think you'll, do you want to kind of continue with that transformation of that subject? And do you think you'll, you'll change your process or your approach towards healing? Yeah. Like have you, have you given it much thought? Um, it's funny because three days ago, after six years of not using color, I painted with color for the first time, and that was, uh, it was quite, was, I mean, the issue is just that I was working with, with the ashes, and it was really about the imprint of the story, and I felt that color would kind of get in the way of the energetic prints on the canvas, it would become distracting, and what was important was to get the story through the prints. But, um, the works that I did a couple of days ago, I found myself kind of going deeper into universal consciousness and trying to get into like a deeper, more subtle place. And uh, in terms of in terms of connectivity, and I think that that process is also very healing because a lot of the pain we carry is from feeling disconnected either to community or to source or to nature. And um, so it's very possible that the techniques and the process will change, but I think there is a strong desire to keep going deeper into the essence of who we are and why we're here and that kind of questioning. Mm -hmm. But like I said before, um, you know, I'm very reactive to the place I live in. I chose to live here mm -hmm. because I think that there's a lot of work to do as an artist and so I want to also be listening in mm -hmm. to what the environment mm -hmm. wants to tell me because I'm, I, I hope to always have this play um, or dialogue with, with where I am in the world. Um, Yeah. A very specific question. I'm very curious. <coughs> um, the phase that you yeah. learned, yeah. that in your transformation phase early on, what were they made of? It's a very thin cloth. It's called a mandil. It's a white fabric. Yes, it's a mandil. Yes. What is it made of? Cotton, Cotton. or synthetic stuff? Because yeah. <laughs> I am very kind. Yeah. Especially with that first. Yeah photograph of you in yeah. front of the uh, yeah. Yeah. pot with, yes. with the fire coming out. I yeah. was thinking, I hope there's nothing synthetic there yeah. because you would be smelling, yes. inhaling fumes that are very toxic. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I, um, yeah. So I'm <laughs> very curious and, and to have done so many. Yes. I'm worried about... Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, seriously. I'm more worried I'm about land from land land That's why I'm Okay, asking. yeah. No, I, um, uh, I have used all kinds, so it's whatever I find. Sometimes, um, you know, I used to go to Damascus a lot to buy materials and, um, and go shopping there for textiles for nice. my older work. So yes. I, I have stuff from there. I have stuff that, uh, from, my, from my aunt who's veiled. Some are synthetic, some just melt into a ball of plastic. And some completely um, disintegrate. Yeah, into so beautiful ash. Yes. yes. So uh, it it always depends. But like I said, I'm more concerned with the landmines than I am with the <laughs> yeah yeah. And and some of the places where I've worked, I mean, like um, Khiam, you know, um, there's uh, every place has its um, 
its challenges. Mm. And uh, so sometimes it's toxic. I, I mean, even Rabbi Baida, sometimes it's literally like in Su'l Gharib, you know, there's still areas that are unsafe because of landmines. And sometimes it's just, it's also how do you communicate with people that you want to come to this place and do this type of work um, in a country where contemporary art is very new. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I've had to learn how to also be completely transparent and trusting. Um, and I found that, you know, that was also healing in itself. So getting permission to work at Qiyam prison meant that um, I had to establish meetings with Hezbollah. And, uh, you know, to explain that I'm coming to do a healing process, I really, I realized the only way this could work would be to be completely honest and open. And that, those conversations were some of the most incredible I had because they, they really pushed me hard in terms of thinking like, you know, what is the line between healing and forgiveness? You know, um, do we forget? Do we forgive? Um, does art really make a difference? You know, and that's why I keep coming back to this thing about the, the human, that perhaps it doesn't even matter whatever art it was that was made there, it was the, the conversations and the interactions that was, you know, that's, the that's, of that's where it is, yeah. yeah. Did you write about these conversations? Did I write about them? No, of course Um... No, <laughs> no, I'm working on a book now which documents the exhibition. Um, so perhaps there's, there might be a little bit of that there. Yeah, like there is some of the stuff I talked about there. Mm -hmm. But um, it's very different having a conversation being recorded. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.